Hello class, this is Ms. Augustine, and today we are going to start talking about water and solutions, and so that would be chapters 17 and 18 in our textbook. So first let's talk about types of mixtures, and this goes back to the beginning of the year, I want to say chapter 2-ish, um, where we talked about homogeneous mixtures, and that would be a mixture that has only one phase, and we have the special name, we call that a solution and then heterogeneous mixtures, and that's any mixture that has two or more phases. And again, examples would be things like um, salad dressing, muddy water, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, where you can see more than one phase. So um, for aqueous solutions, we're talking about solutions where uh, water is the solvent, and so the terms that we use are solute, which is the thing being dissolved, the solvent, which is the thing that is doing the dissolving, and for aqueous solutions, the dissolving medium is water, and solution is that mixture of solute and solvent, and solvation is the process that occurs when a solute dissolves in a solvent, and that's solvation as opposed to salvation. Uh, and uh, the solution process can be endothermic or exothermic, that is to say when you dissolve something in a solvent it may get cold if it's endothermic or it may get hot if it's exothermic. So solutions are these homogeneous mixtures of two or more pure substances. Um, they're mixed at the molecular level, so the thing that distinguishes what type of a mixture it is is really about the size of the particles. So with solutions, the mixture is at the level of molecules, so the particles are smaller than one nanometer, remembering that a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus 9 meters. And then we have suspensions, and those are heterogeneous mixtures of pure substances that have larger particle sizes than solutions, so the particles are greater than 100 nanometers, and the particles in the solvent are so large that unless you keep stirring them, they will settle to the bottom. So a good example would be uh, muddy water. If it was left alone, it would eventually settle out to the bottom, but if it's being stirred up, it will stay um, suspended, so to speak. And then another type of mixture is a colloid, and one of my favorite types of colloid would be mayonnaise, which is a mixture of what you see here, which is some lemon juice, some seasonings, some eggs, and some oil. And it's whipped around, in this case with a whisk, and you actually have the particles are dispersed uh, between the size of solutions and suspensions, so the particle size is intermediate, so it's greater than a nanometer, but less than 100 nanometers, and the stuff stays dispersed, so they're called colloids, and there's the dispersed phase, which is whatever the particles are, and then the dispersing medium, which would be analogous to the solvent, so it's the phase that's holding the particles. And emulsions are the special liquid-liquid colloid, and that is, as I said, uh, one of my favorite colloids, which is mayonnaise. So another thing we do to distinguish whether it is a true solution or not is we observe something called the Tyndall effect. So if it's a suspension, the suspended particles are large enough to capture the light and to uh, scatter it. So this would be a true solution where the particles are on the order of a billionth of a meter and they are not large enough to scatter the light. And in the case of a suspension where the particles are greater than 100 nanometers, you get light scattering. And this is another example of it here where it's a true solution and then here where it's a um, a suspension, and again it is able to show you the difference between whether you have a true solution or a suspension or a colloid. And the Tyndall effect is what accounts for on a foggy night why you need to use fog lamps because your headlight beam is being scattered by the water in that case that's in the, um, in the atmosphere.
So then we talk about the electrolytes versus non-electrolytes. So sometimes when you're doing a heavy-duty workout, they'll tell you to replenish your electrolytes by drinking a sports drink like Gatorade or I don't know what some of the others are, smart water, whatever. Um, the idea is that they're going to replenish your electrolytes. So what are electrolytes? They're these compounds that can conduct current in their aqueous solution or when they're molten. So for instance, ionic compounds, sodium chloride, uh, copper 2 sulfate, sodium hydroxide, all of these things um, are able to conduct electricity in water and that's because that when you put them in water they um, dissociate into their free ions and that's why you don't use your hair dryer while you're sitting in the bathtub because that water has bath salts in it and it will conduct electricity whereas non-electrolytes are compounds that do not conduct an electric current in the aqueous or molten state and so typically those are covalent compounds things that are molecular um, are covalently bonded they don't dissociate when you put them into water and so they don't have any ions to conduct electricity so there's an experiment that we would do if we were in class where I would take a beaker of water and I would suspend some electrodes into it that have a light bulb between them and I would hook it up to a power source and what we would see is that uh, we could actually measure the flow of electricity uh, so we're fl measuring the flow of electrons through the circuit and if it measures a current and the bulb glows then the solution is conducting electricity and if it doesn't measure a current the bulb won't light up and it is not conducting so i thought at this point i usually use this FET uh, simulator and what i have here is um, a beaker of water and i can let more water in and i can let water out and I can decide whether I want to put in salt or sugar and this will show me my concentration and I can also show whether or not it's conducting electricity so I'm gonna bring over here my electrodes and I'm going to shake in some sugar first and I'm gonna just keep on shaking in sugar and till it's empty and you'll notice that absolutely nothing is happening here with my light bulb so now I'm gonna remove the sugar and I'm gonna switch to salt and I'm going to shake in salt and notice what's happening over here my light bulb poor substitute for the real world but my light bulb is lighting up so that's showing you that what's going on here is that the salt causes the light bulb to light up which means it's an electrolyte and the sugar doesn't so now I like to show you at the micro scale what's going on so this is my sodium chloride and when I shake it in to my solution you'll notice that the NAs and the CLs dissociate they are free ions which is why they can conduct electricity and again the chlorides are the green and the sodiums are the pink now let's switch and we're going to reset and I'm gonna switch to sucrose and I'm gonna shake in my sucrose and sucrose is C12 H22 O11 and you will notice it is covalent it does not break apart so now I want to show you what's going at a micro level and I'm going to show you the partial charges so you'll see that water has uh, the oxygen end is negative and the hydrogen end is positive so if I take a sucrose and put it in here two sucroses it does not dissociate whereas let me get rid of the sucrose put my charges back in if I put the sodium chloride in and I'm gonna stop this really quick what happens is that the sodiums and the chlorides separate and you'll see that the waters have the positive end surrounding 
the chloride and the negative end around the sodium. And that's why water is able to dissolve sodium chloride because it is partial, has a partial charge. So then the next thing that we talk about 